Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for, for joining me. I'm Andrew Ginter. I'm introducing myself. I guess the, the lady who was supposed to introduce me took sick today, so you're, you're stuck with me. Um, I work at Waterfall Security Solutions. I am the uh, Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall. Um, I lead a, a team of experts that work with the world's most secure industrial sites. Um, you know, if you're curious, a word of background, I spent 10 years developing industrial control system product. I spent five years developing middleware product that connected control systems to IT networks and thereby connected a lot of networks together and contributed to the cybersecurity problems that now plague many industries. I got religion, I wound up the chief technology officer at Industrial Defender, building the world's first industrial SEM, and you know, here I am at Waterfall. Um, my topic today is OT security. The world has changed. It changed in 2020, and nobody noticed. Um, what happened? So what I'm about to show you is uh, data from a new report uh, that came out. It's a cooperation between the ICS Strive Incident Repository and Waterfall Security. Um, I'm the principal author. Um, you know, we looked around and said there's a lot of data out there and we're not really sure what it means. Um, there's reports out there from telecommunications providers saying we defeated 1.3 million attacks on critical infrastructure last year. And I'm looking at the report going, what does that mean? You dropped 1.3 million packets, didn't you? And you counted each of them as an attack on critical infrastructure. Um, you know, so we went to the other extreme with this report. We said, let's look at cyber attacks, not errors and omissions, cyber attacks that caused shutdowns or worse at industrial sites. And we focused on, I'm, so I was the principal author, we focused on the industries that I'm most familiar with, which are uh, discrete manufacturing, you know, everything from consumer goods to automobiles and process industries, uh, everything from heavy industry, you know, critical infrastructures, power, oil and gas, to, I don't know, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals and food and beverage. Um, and so we looked for real outages, attacks causing real outages. What did we find? You know, how many attacks were there like that in 2010? There was one. It was Stuxnet. You all heard about it. Uh, you know, destroyed uh, a thousand centrifuges in Iran. In 2012, there was nothing. There were lots of attacks infecting control system components, but none of them triggered a shutdown or any other physical consequence. Um, in 2012, there was one. Hacktivists took down an oil terminal in Iran. In 2013, there was nothing. In 2014, there was the German steel mill. It was never named, but it was widely reported. Massive damages uh, due to a cyber attack. Nobody ever said, was it ransomware? Was it just a common virus? Uh, it triggered an unplanned shutdown. An un unplanned shutdown in a plant like this means you have to rebuild the blast furnace from scratch. They're designed to be re rebuilt from scratch, but still, it's, a, it's an expensive proposition. In 2015, there was one. This was the first attack on the Ukraine, shut down power to 225,000 subscribers. It was attributed to Russia, but you know, it was it was uh, widely attributed to Russia. Uh, but Russia never took responsibility for it. The next year, 2016, there was one of these attacks. The second attack on the Ukraine took down the main uh, high voltage substation in uh, in Kiev, the capital. 2017 was a busy year. This was the year of NotPetya. This was one attack that hit hundreds of victims. Among those victims were Maersk, the world's largest container shipping company. They went down for six days. Uh, among the victims were Merck Pharmaceutical that suffered a shutdown and was awarded $1.4 billion in damages from the insurance company. Uh, in a, not right away, they had to go to court, but the courts awarded $1.4 billion with a B, not, not million, not 10 to the 6th, we're talking 10 to the 9th dollars. Um, sorry, that was also the year, 2017 was also the year of Triton. Triton attacked, sabotaged safety systems in a petrochemical facility in the Middle East and uh, shut that facility down twice. So I counted it as one attack 
with two consequences, shutting the same facility down twice. They finally discovered the attack on the second shutdown and cleaned it out. Um, 2018, there was one. This was the uh, iPhone manufacturer in Taiwan. 2019, there was four attacks. Uh, the big headline was Norsk Hydro. Uh, they also produce aluminum. Three or four of their sheet aluminum plants uh, had to be shut down. In 2020, there were 10 attacks that shut down industrial sites. All of them were ransomware. The first one, Picanol, shut down 14 sites worldwide. Um, there was almost 50 sites shut down by these 10 attacks. Last year, there were 22 attacks that shut down physical operations. The big one everyone heard about was Colonial Pipeline, but there was 21 others. Almost all of them were ransomware. This year, we have only tracked through the middle of the year, through the end of June, and uh, we are at 26 attacks through the middle of the year. We're, we're predicting over 50 attacks by the end of the year. We're predicting over 200 sites are being shut down. Most of these attacks shut down multiple sites. The world has changed. Um, in, in English, we call it a state change. It's like the change between water being a liquid and water being a solid. We've seen a state change in the threat environment. It went from a decade of being a largely theoretical problem to being a real problem of ransomware shutting us down. We are predicting a second state change coming within five years where ransomware is going to start causing more physical consequences than just shutdowns. I say it's a state change. Let me ask you, does anyone here believe we are ever going to go back to the way we were in 2018 with one attack that had physical consequences? Or 2013, zero attacks. I don't believe it. I think this is only going to get worse. We're on track to double the number of attacks or more than double the number of attacks with physical consequences every year for the next few years. This is exponential growth. You can calculate for yourself how many doublings it's going to take before every one of us suffers one of these shutdowns every year or two. Uh, in terms of distribution, most of the attacks so far have been in uh, food and beverage and discrete manufacturing, you know, consumer goods, um, automobiles, this kind of thing. Um, this is not surprising. These industries are not well known for being very secure. What was a little surprising was transportation. Rail systems are very safety critical. You would expect that rail systems are more secure than average. It turns out that the 20% or the 18% outages there um, had more to do with uh, ticketing systems going down, shutting down the rail system, not so much with the safety systems being compromised. So that's a little bit less surprising. What was surprising was process industries, was oil and gas. The oil and gas sector is very well known for being extremely secure. The oil and gas sector created the first industrial security standard. We all might think it was 62443, but it wasn't. The first 62443 standard came out in 2009. The first standard for the oil industry was the American Petroleum Institute put out a standard in, what was it, 2004, 2006, something like that, well before 62443. And yet, they got hit by ransomware and went down. Um, this was so surprising, not just to me, but to the authorities, that 30 days after Colonial Pipeline went down, uh, there were new regulations. There were the first ever regulations for uh, petrochemical pipelines in the United States. The world has changed. Um, almost all of these attacks are ransomware. The rest of them so far are hacktivists. Um, the problem we're seeing here is that we're looking at the tools and the techniques that are reported to be used in these attacks. And all of these attacks, by the way, are in the public record. You can go to you know, the New York Times. You can go to Bloomberg and verify every one of these attacks. None of these are privately disclosed. Um, but what the public record shows is that the tools and techniques being used by ransomware actors are behind, are trailing uh, 
what we're seeing nation states using by less than five years. So a lot of us imagine, you know, I'm not really important enough to be the target of a nation state attack. Why would a nation state come after me? Here's the problem. What we see the nation states doing to each other today, we will see ransomware doing to all of us with money in less than five years. So we need to start getting ready today for what we see the nation states doing because ransomware is going to use those same attacks against us. Um, So in more detail, what are we seeing? What's, what's going on with this ransomware? How can ransomware shut down physical operations? It turns out there's three ways ransomware is shutting down uh, power plants and pipelines and uh, you know, manufacturing sites. Um, the first of these is IT dependencies. If our industrial systems depend on services in the IT network for minute-by-minute minute operation, and the IT network is crippled and cannot provide those services anymore, our, our industrial system goes down. Um, you know, the classic example is Active Directory. A lot of us have deployed one Active Directory tree for the entire company. This is a benefit because a lot of standards, a lot of best practice says, you know, if an employee leaves the company, then we should be able to press a button and revoke that employee's access company-wide. And uh, so we deploy these Active Directory systems. Here's the problem. If ransomware gets into the, uh, the IT network and cripples the Active Directory server, and our industrial sites, all 17 of them, depend on the Active Directory servers in the IT network, now nobody can log into the industrial sites anymore. No new processes can start everything fails. So IT dependencies are a big problem. In the NERC SIP standard, this is for the electric grid, this is actually reflected. A lot of people do not realize that the NERC SIP standard forbids critical operations depending on a corporate Active Directory server. There's no words in the standard that say you cannot use a corporate Active Directory server. What the standard says is if you do use that, then the Active Directory server becomes an electronic access control mechanism and comes into scope for all of the rules. And there's a lot of rules for electronic access control mechanisms. And IT people go, whoa, there's no way we're going to be able to follow all these rules. And they set up a second Active Directory server. A lot of people don't realize this until they fail their first audit, <laughs> and they have to take corrective action. But you know, this is this is best practice in the electric grid. You know, this is this is the world we live in. The second way that ransomware shuts down operations is through an abundance of caution. The classic example here is Colonial Pipeline. When ransomware took down Colonial's uh, IT network, there was no evidence, zero evidence, that the ransomware had moved into the OT network. But the industrial network controlled a large, powerful, dangerous physical process, a gasoline pipeline. Uh, you know, people imagine that gasoline is flammable. Yes, well, it's al actually also explosive. I mean, this is what it does in your, in your vehicles. It explodes in the, in the pistons. So um, Colonial said, we cannot take the chance that the ransomware is going to move through our ITOT interface, and so they shut down operations until the IT network was clean again. Um, you know, what does this mean? Really, what it means is that we do not trust the strength of the security program in our industrial network to defend against this ransomware. And so we must shut it down. That's the only reasonable thing we can do when we cannot trust that our security is strong enough. The third way is the obvious way, which is the ransomware targets the industrial network directly. This was the, uh, the case at Honda. Honda suffered uh, uh, a shutdown from the Snake ransomware, or ECANS. This is Snake spelled backwards. Um, the Snake ransomware includes code that says, if I'm running in an industrial network and I see any of these hundreds of different kinds of servers running that are industrial servers, shut them down so that I can encrypt the configuration files and I can encrypt the database files. 
So there is ransomware out there that deliberately targets operations. What are we going to do about this? I don't want to come here and you know, tell you gloom and doom. Let's look at some solutions. Um, what I am most excited about is something that came out two months ago from the US Department of Energy. Uh, in the description, I got a, a word wrong. It wasn't the US Department of Engineering. It was the US Department of Energy, DOE. Um, and they put out a report saying you know, a national cyber-informed engineering strategy. What is cyber-informed engineering? Well, you know, let me give you an example. Um, let's imagine we are all technicians, and our job is to keep four very large boilers running. These are six-story boilers um, in a, a coal-fired power plant. The, the coal dust goes into the furnace. It burns instantly, it heats the boiler, the boilers produce steam, the steam drives the turbine, the turbine drives the generator. This is called a generating unit. So we're the technician responsible for the boilers in four generating units. These things are massive. If they blow up and we are inside the blast radius, we will die, okay? This is, this is the nature of the, of the boiler. And if a cyber attack gets in there and um, misoperates the furnace, we risk the boiler overpressurizing and blowing up. If this was us, would we prefer, uh, as a you know, as protection against that class of cyber attack, would we prefer a a valve that physically is forced open by the steam if the if the boiler overpressurizes and you know has a pin so that it breaks the pin? And when the pin is broken, the valve does not close anymore. It stays open until we repair the cyber attack, we repair the boiler, uh, then we can pressurize the boiler again. Would we like that as protection for our lives from the boiler blowing up, or would we prefer a longer password on the computer controlling the boiler? I know I would prefer the valve, thank you. This is an engineering, it's a safety engineering solution to a problem of physical risk physical risk due to a cyber attack. The NIST cybersecurity framework says nothing about that possible way of dealing with cyber risk. Um, the engineering profession has managed physical risk for over a century. This is what, you know, this is one of the main jobs of engineers. This is why it's a profession like doctors, like lawyers. Um, and this report is calling upon the profession to step up to the task of managing physical risk due to cyber attacks. Um, now this is just a strategy. This does not define what cybersecurity or what, what you know security engineering is. It says we need to define what cybersecurity or what, what sorry security engineering is. We need to uh, edu you know we need the, the universities and the professions to come on board with our definition. We need to create a body of knowledge. So this is not documenting what security engineering is. This is sort of documenting what uh, the, the process that we're gonna use to define what security engineering is. Um, and you know, to me, one of the essential components of security engineering is you know, what I call engineering grade solutions. An engineering grade solution is one that works the same way all of the time in the face of a defined threat environment. You know, a lot of us you know, come from the IT space, and there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, in the IT space, the right way you know, to deal with the threat that we're seeing every day of ransomware coming in, thousands of sites going down, the right way is a very vigorous process of detecting, responding, and recovering from attacks. This is the, the pinnacle, this is the gold standard for IT security. Legitimately so, it's the right solution for IT networks. It's not the right solution on industrial networks. Um, on an industrial network, um, you know, we're looking, we're looking for something much more predictable on an industrial network. You know, with, with Detect, Respond, and Recover, we hope that we can discover the attack before uh, there are serious consequences. We hope that we can scramble our incident response teams in time to prevent consequences. We hope that those teams can figure out that this is a real attack and not a false alarm 
in time to prevent consequences. Um, here's the thing, hope is not good engineering. Would you drive across a bridge if you knew that the design engineer for the bridge hoped that the bridge would hold up to the specified load for the specified number of decades? No, we expect predictable solutions out of, out of our, our engineers. I'm running a little behind, but I wanted to, to, to say this. Here are some examples of what, in my estimation, and you know, I'm only one of the people interacting with the Department of Energy on this, this body of knowledge. Um, here are some examples of what belongs in the body of knowledge. Um, in the middle there, security PHA review is safety engineering. The example I gave with the overpressure valve, that is an example out of the, the, the security PHA review book. Uh, published by the ISA, the same people who produced the 62443 standards. Um, Countering Cyber Sabotage is a publication out of, you know, by a couple of authors out of Idaho National Labs. Uh, they do a lot of work in the industrial security space. You know, security PHA review basically is focused on preventing unacceptable safety outcomes from cyber attacks. CCE expands the scope and says, you know, there's other unacceptable outcomes. Damage to very expensive, very difficult to replace equipment, like a whole power plant. If you damage the plant, it goes down for nine months, not for nine days. Um, this is also unacceptable, and so expands, you know, some of the techniques on the engineering side. Now, don't get me wrong, CCE is primarily a risk assessment methodology, but they have several chapters on engineering grade mitigations as well. And uh, the third one is the book that I wrote, uh, Secure Operations Technology. Uh, this is a book about, in a sense, you know, what, what happens if, if we discover it? What happens if that, that valve breaks and the steam escapes? The plant shuts down, or at least that generating unit shuts down, so that there's not an explosion. What happens if, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the digital logic not cyber logic, but you know, digital logic that CCE recommends discovers a condition that's going to damage equipment. It shuts down the process in an emergency mode to prevent damage to the equipment. The SECO T methodology says, well, it's great that we've prevented people dying. It's great that we've prevented damage to the equipment. Um, we, but really, what we want to do is keep the equipment running. And so SECO T is engineering grade mitigations to keep the system to keep, keep the attacks out in the first place so that we don't need the second and third levels to activate and, and shut down our, our, uh, our physical operations. Um, network engineering is uh, one of the important components. Um, the, the point here is that, that it's great to use, you know, sort of conventional network designs inside an industrial network. It's great to use conventional network designs outside of the industrial network on the business network. But at the boundary, what we have here is two networks where the worst case consequences of compromise differ materially. You know, we cannot restore damaged equipment and human lives from backups. So where you have this material difference in consequence, this is where we deploy something stronger. And what network engineering you know, recommends is deploying something like a unidirectional gateway. For anyone not familiar with it, unidirectional gateway technology is physically able to send information in only one direction from the industrial network out to the world, most commonly. Um, the software makes copies of servers and emulates devices. The, uh, you know, if we have a, an OPC server or a, uh, uh, a database, like a SQL database in the industrial network that contains all of the data that we're allowed to share with the, with the enterprise. The software logs into that database, logs into that server, acquires a snapshot of all the data, pushes it through the strange one-way hardware, and populates an identical server on the outside network. Now anybody on the outside network who needs the data can ask the outside server for the data and get the same answer as if they had asked the inside server. But of course, no question ever goes back through the one-way hardware. It's not possible to send questions back into the, into the industrial network. It's also no longer necessary to send information back into the industrial network because everything that's allowed to be shared with the business is out there already. So I'm running short um, very quickly. If you put something like this in place, um, it's not possible for 
OT systems to depend on IT anymore because no information from IT can come back. You discover those dependencies very quickly and have to deal with them. It's not possible, or you, you, rather you no longer need to shut down in an abundance of caution because it's not possible for ransomware or any other attack to move through the one-way hardware into the network. All cyber sabotage attacks are information. If no information can get in, no attacks can get in. And similarly, you cannot use your remote control ransomware to target the OT directly because your, your remote control attack commands do not get in anymore. I've got some resources here. Um, I have a half dozen of the, uh, the SecOT books here. My, my employer gives them away for free. Um, if you're interested, come on up, grab a book. Um, if I don't have enough here or you've got to run, uh, the URL is waterfall-security.com slash sec-ot, and you can request your own copy. Um, they tend to ship at the end of the month. Give it a good five, six weeks uh, before you start scratching your head why you, why you haven't received it. I'm also the co-host of the Industrial Security Podcast, available on your, uh, your cell phones. Um, it's not about Waterfall, it's about our guest, it's about industrial security. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the outage report is available under resources on the Waterfall website. Uh, a word about Waterfall, we invented the unidirectional gateway, this is why I'm such a, a champion of it. Uh, we're deployed worldwide, we're trusted by critical infrastructures all over the world. Um, and this is my last slide. You can read it for yourself. Uh, you know, we need security engineering. We also need cybersecurity. Security engineering is not able to eliminate all cyber risk. And so we need still strong cybersecurity programs to deal with the leftover, the residual risk. Um, network engineering is an important part of uh, security engineering. Uh, my book documents several you know, approaches to network engineering. This is what I had for you. Um, we have time for maybe one question. Is there, is there a question that people have? Yes. So, that's right. So the, the, uh, the question was about residual risk. Um, you did not say the words, but I'm gonna paraphrase what you said. Um, a truism of uh, cybersecurity is that given enough time, money, and talent, any security posture can be breached. Um, and so the question becomes, how does, what does this mean for security engineering? And you're right, I, you said I gave the answer. The answer is, we need a, a strong cybersecurity program behind the security engineering to deal with the leftover risk. You know, a lot of people say we need defense in depth, and I agree, but a lot of the defense in depth advice out there is like saying, let's overlap layers of Swiss cheese. Um, antivirus will deal with certain threats, but really, you know, is a host base, doesn't do anything about the network. Firewalls will deal with certain threats, but, you know, the, the ransomware gets through firewalls at the interface between the internet and the IT network thousands of times a year, doesn't it? So we're overlapping these layers of Swiss cheese trying to find an orientation where we don't have any holes going straight through anymore. What I prefer, the analogy I prefer is that, you know, security engineering is more like a steel plate. It says no more safety consequences from cyber attacks. And, you know, CCE, you know, is another steel plate in a different orientation saying, and no equipment damage from cyber attacks either. So when we have two or three overlapping steel plates, there might still be, theoretically, a way to get in there. We still need cybersecurity. Get some Swiss cheese and arrange it over top of the steel plates. I feel much more comfortable with steel plates than I do with overlapping Swiss cheese. And one of the good points, one of the, the benefits of security engineering is the steel plates eliminate so much of the threat that instead of the very expensive, you know, we all know how difficult it is to patch systems. We all know how difficult it is to apply even antivirus on industrial networks. Um, the beautiful thing about the security engineering approach is that you take so much of the risk away, we can focus the leftover cybersecurity efforts on what's left over, on that handful of machines that are still exposed to incoming information flows. We can reduce the cost of those programs dramatically and increase the coverage of the, com the combination of security engineering and cybersecurity. We need both 
Each of them has a role. That's what I had. Thank you so much. Uh, like I said, I've got some books here if uh, you come on up. First come, first served. <laughs>